Well, uh, thanks for sharing the next 18 minutes or so with me. Uh, <coughs> as uh, Aaron mentioned, uh, I am originally Swedish. Uh, I am Australian as well nowadays. Uh, there's another figure who's also a Swede, the chairperson of BP, who just went to the US and tried to explain why uh, BP has not uh, really been able to rectify a small problem in the Gulf as yet. And um, being Swedish, he um, stumbled upon one of these things that we do when we try to speak in foreign languages. He uh, said that BP is caring about the ordinary person, but being Swedish, he used a direct translation, which was a small person. So all of the US is now up in arms thinking that BP th uh, says that they um, uh, care about the dwarfs and midgets. <laughs> <laughs> so I will do my best to provide you with one or two of those platitudes and uh, uh, false translations. And when you figure them out, when you hear them, uh, please tell me afterwards and we have a good laugh about it. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about something now um, that I've been looking at over the last few years. It's, Thoughts that have been maturing, and I'm going to talk about one specific part of a group of thoughts where I see one very um, common part of our lives changing very much, which is road traffic. We all have road traffic, we all engage and participate in road traffic in different ways. I drive my car every day, that's how I participate. And road traffic is something that is just very full, riddled with problems and issues, and people are very passionate about road traffic, uh, be it that it's very costly or that it's spent a very long time in queues or what it might be. So I'm going to talk about very much a, uh, an idea or a way of looking at what can possibly be done. As an academic, I'm blessed that I can challenge, I can challenge all the truths and I, can, I have the ability to think in, in radical ways and explore and experience different things without having to get corporate uh, um, okay before, get all these all the funds to actually go down the path. I'm allowed to do something that's absolutely insane. And whether this is insane or not, I think it's a very interesting idea. So I'm going to share it. I'm going to talk about speed limits. And speed limits is something that, as a young man, you don't like. And I must say, I don't like speed limits, but for a different reason that I'm going to share with you now. Uh, because I'm not a young man anymore. Why do we have speed limits? Well, we are, we are not very good at driving many times. We create situations that are not very desirable. Uh, sometimes we follow the law and we follow what we're supposed to do and still we cause havoc. Sometimes we don't follow the law and we cause havoc. Anyway, we look at it, we have accidents and incidents on our road, and they're very costly in terms of human suffering and financial cost as well. Cost to society uh, when you have lots of queues and you can't get uh, through, through the road. And speed limits is something that governments use, or authorities use, in order to limit the effects of these things that we do on the roads that are wrong. Now, I'm going to start going through some things that goes into the model that is used to, to, to determine what a speed limit should be and where I think in the future we can actually step away from speed limits. So I'm going to start now looking at cars. A few years ago I was 18 years old and my first car was a Volvo 164, I'm Swedish, did I mention that? <laughs> a Volvo 164. It had a radio, AM and FM, two loudspeakers, it was fairly modern, it wasn't mono. It had a nice V6 engine, it was very comfortable to ride in, and leather seats, and I felt really happy to have this car. What did it not have? Well, there were no crumble zones. There was no ABS brake. There was no airbag. The state of the art was seat belts. Today, you would say that it was not the safest of vehicles to ride, drive around in, especially when you are 18 and you've got a lot of horsepower in it. And I would agree. But this type of vehicle, not too long ago, was the norm on our roads, and many of the speed limits that we see today were set when this was the norm. What do we have as a counterexample, or a different kind of vehicle? We are not looking at buses and motorcycles, or let's stick to cars. Here's another car that's slightly more modern, the Bugatti Veyron. It's got over a thousand brake horsepower. 
is being clocked to 408 kilometers per hour. What does it have in terms of funky features? Well, it has, I had to read this, cross-drilled radially vented carbon fiber reinforced silicon carbide composite discs <laughs> for brakes. It's got 30 titanium pistons in the calipers to, to get the grip into those discs. It's got an ABS in the handbrake. So if you pull the handbrake, you try to you know, do that stunt and spin around and... No, you've got an ABS brake, you can't do that. <laughs> it's got a wing, and you can tilt the wing. So when you're going at full speed, at 400 k's an hour, that wing will give you 0.4 g stopping force. $24,000 for a set of tyres. And you have to give the car back to Bugatti to change the tyres because your local shop can't do it. Now, this is a very different kind of vehicle. <laughs> very different kind of vehicle with different capabilities. Let's look at what goes into vehicles today. In ordinary vehicles, we have a lot of different technologies that are starting to be rolled out in family cars, and everyone's got this. Sat-nav unit, you can get some information about obstacles if, if there is a bad road condition somewhere. Uh, you've got uh, different types of radars for collision avoidance, checking what the distance is to the car in front of you, a car uh, behind you. In fact, there's a whole plethora of different types of driver assist systems, ranging from lane change assist systems to, to collision avoidance systems. There's night vision enhancement systems. Uh, the reverse sensors that, that stop you from backing into the car in front of you are very useful. In fact, vehicles are today pretty damn smart. They can even drive you around autonomously. Right. My foot is on the brake. I'm now going to push this little button on the steering wheel here, and it will set off at um, race speed. <laughs> Now, now you see that's uncanny. It's revving up to 7,000 RPM, changing gear. It's turned right. It's coming to the first corner. Brake, please brake, brake, brake! Brake, brake! It's hideous. I can't believe this! <laughs> For those of you who have, who have not seen this before, I need to explain what is happening. If you buy a BMW F530 and you want to know how to drive it properly, you can go to BMW and you can be put into this car, which they put on a racetrack, and it will drive you around in the fashion of an F1 driver. So you can really see how the car should be driven. <laughs> BMW does this with the most famous motor journalist in the world, knowing that the car will be able to pull it off. They rely on this technology and they trust this technology. So cars, when it comes to driver support systems and ability by cars to do different things, the abilities are changing very rapidly. And we see that the difference between this type of car and my Volvo 164, they're far apart, the different capabilities. Okay, that's vehicles. What about drivers? Are drivers a homogenous group that do just about the same thing? I think not. Let's look at some examples. So this was a film that was taken in my hometown of Stockholm. Someone who likes to drive fast to work. Obviously he likes his work very much. <laughs> As a counter example, we have this. This priest might be Canada's slowest driver. Now this is going to be a joy. What do you think my argument is here? Obviously, the young man on the motorcycle should not have to obey any speed limits because he's so clever and good. Where's the 
slightly not so uh, young priest should have severe feelings. No, that's not my argument. <laughs> my argument is that people in traffic, they create different risk levels, different forms of risk, and they've got different abilities. I'm a very different driver now to what I was when I was 18. I would have been more in the motorcycle camp, I'm ashamed to say. Today I have reduced eyesight and I'm not that interested in driving that fast because I've got kids and I want to see them at night. But drivers are different. It's a, homog it is a heterogeneous set of, of, of drivers out there with very different attitudes, aggressiveness and capabilities producing different risk levels. What about the environment, the external environment? Well, different types of roads. Here's an example of a very good road to drive on. It's countryside, it's sunshine, good view, dry road, very nice, no traffic. Here's another example, I hope. Nighttime. Well, if you have lived in a country like Sweden, driving at night is an interesting phenomenon. At any point in time, 50 meters in front of your car, there can be a 700 kilogram moose running across the road. <laughs> and just because it's nighttime, you won't see it. And that is a fact. It's a very different scenario, the external road here. And going to the extreme, this is what I grew up with. And this is very fostering when it comes to driver techniques and, and ability to, to drive your car safely. When it is snowing and it's dark 24 hours a day, the world is grey. There is no visibility. And the road is very slippery. And the best of drivers, every now and then, they just hit this one little icy patch and go out in the snow drift and you have to get towed out of the snow drift before you can continue. And everyone's got warm clothes in the car and a shovel in the car so you can dig yourself out. Very different types of conditions that you have when you're driving as well. So, if we take all these three together, the vehicles, the drivers, and external conditions, and we look at the blanket speed limit that is put on something, does it make sense? Well, actually, yes. You might be surprised to hear me say that. It does make sense because currently we don't have any other way of regulating the effects of, of uh, accidents. But things are about to change, and this is when it starts getting a bit interesting. We have one thing that is happening right now that enables us to do something different, and that is communication, networking, wireless networks. Ta-da! Comes back to my now research over wireless networks. Wireless networks enable us to share information, and we have different kinds of wireless networks and communication channels available. Currently, we have already, uh, we get information through SACNAV units uh, from some central authority about uh, where there are congestions and where there are roadworks, etc. We have smartphones of different uh, varieties in our, in our cars that we carry with us, and the thing, the blob here in the middle, which is so important, this is a little chipset for a new radio called the DSRC, the Dedicated Short Range Communication Radio. It was supposed to be rolled out in new vehicles already, but there was a snag. We had a little financial hiccup along the way, so it has been delayed. But over the next few years, we'll see this radio being rolled out in all new vehicles. Dedicated communication channel for all vehicles on our road once it's been phased in. And once we start to have these radios rolled out everywhere, we can start to do things that are really, really funky. We can start considering the road as a big virtual communication sphere where vehicles are an integrated part of the road infrastructure. Information sharing is just as important as filling up with, uh, with fuel or making the car just run around these roads. When this happens, what will cars do? Well, they will start sending out information to each other. Information about their position. So if two vehicles run into an intersection with a house in between and neither of them intend to stop, you can identify that you will have a collision because you have positioning information. You can send out information about what the conditions are. 
is, is the temperature starting to fall below zero. You can send it to vehicles behind you to warm and to slow down because the road is going to get slippery. You can send out information about vehicle capabilities, driver capabilities, and the environment. And when this happens, you can start doing what we have started to do in my research group at the University of Sydney right now. You can start to model risk. So this is where we really step out there and try something new. We take all these different capabilities, we put them into some mathematical models. And these mathematical models aim at giving us a level of risk depending on all these different um, parameters as, as input. So let me just tell you now about what we're up to and where we, we see the metaphor and where we hope to go right now. It's going to take us a few years, definitely, because it's not easy. There are a lot of I don't knows here. And it's going to take a lot of research in different areas to find out, I mean, how do you model a driver? How do you model driver capability? It's very difficult. And I'll be speaking to a lot of the expertise around today, and it's very much we don't know. So we're hoping to show that there are real tangible benefits of, of doing this and getting other research groups involved so we can get more real good information and produce really, really good models that can be deployed in, in, in vehicles. My metaphor now, what I really would like to see, instead of having now a speed limit, you get into your car, you drive, and you have a speedometer, and you make sure that your speedometer is around the speed limit, I would like to see that we have instead a riskometer. Depending on the current situation. I want to see that we stay below the risk where we have serious damage, serious implications in, in terms of collisions and, and accidents we cause, and what implications are in terms of personal injury, etc. There is an interesting side effect to this, which is optimization. And this is really how I got into this, because I was starting to think about optimization of road traffic. This is, every talk has to have a graph, if, if, you're, <laughs> if you're an academic and you're an electrical engineer slash computer scientist, you have to have a graph. This is my graph. But it's a very simple graph. What I'm trying to highlight is, there is an acceptable risk, and that is what the road traffic authorities try to hit when they set the speed limit. There is an acceptable risk. If we stay at that risk level, we're doing good. If we go far below that risk level, we're actually not effective or efficient in our system. What I hope to investigate and verify if it holds true is if I can stay up at the risk level all the time, and I can do that by increasing traffic flow or throughput, by having good modeling, then I can get rid of some traffic congestion, hopefully, and make people travel from A to B a lot quicker at the risk level we want. That is where I want to go, where I hope to achieve. How do we do this? Well, we have bought a really, really good simulator by a group in, in Scotland. This is the state of the art that's used by all traffic, road traffic authorities around the world. It simulates driver behavior really, really well. What we do is that we basically run our model and we decide on certain parameters, such as what is the headway you should have to vehicles in front of you. And then we go and we're nasty. We generate some errors, such as we block a lane or generate a collision and we see the, the vehicles that drive up to uh, coming from behind, if they're too close according to the risk model, they will collide. If our risk model is correct, they will be able to stop. So we started to experiment and see how are we faring? And this is what we're simulating big cities. Right now we have a big, big section of Sydney that we're simulating. Uh, and we can do this because we've got some grants for really big computer clusters. 
And this is what it looks like. It's just all these vehicles that we don't control, the simulators controlling this, and they're driving around as drivers do drive around. And then we generate all these events, and we make sure that they just keep these certain parameters that we want them to keep, so minimum headway, for instance. Where are we at right now? Well, as I said, this is really is a cross-disciplinary area. In order to, to understand use and modeling, etc., we, we need to, to get a lot of other people involved. We are now uh, at a stage where we're getting a pretty good idea of single parameter, which is just regulating headway without regulating speed of vehicles. But just by regulating headway, it, we, we are trying, we, we start to learn a lot about our model, which is good. In our early experiments, uh, we have found out that since we're not increasing the, the speed, we, can't, we will have a drop in, in traffic throughput by regulating headway, that's clear. But we see that if we just have a very, very small drop in, in traffic throughput, we have a huge gain in collision avoidance. We limit the number of accidents. And these are really, really positive figures. So, to conclude this, these are very, very uh, novel and out there, freaky ideas of what you can do. But technology is getting to a stage where we can afford to really dream up new ways of doing things. And I believe in a few years' time, we will have enough evidence to show that this is actually a very, very tangible working solution, and we will not necessarily have to rely on the old school speed limits for our safety. Thank you.